today we're going to discuss one of the most famous piano pieces ever composed, and that is a piece commonly known as Für Elise by Beethoven. And the funny thing about this piece is that it's probably now the most famous piece that Beethoven wrote, although actually in his lifetime he had so little regard for it that he didn't even bother to have it published. He seems to have written it quite spontaneously for a woman called Teresa Malfatti, who had the manuscript for many years, and it remained unpublished, and Beethoven doesn't seem to have made any effort to have it published in the form that you've just heard. I'll get back to this later, because the topic of our discussion today is another version of Ferlis that is almost completely unknown, but which Beethoven did prepare for publication in 1822, some years after writing this sketch, which we commonly know as Ferlis. And the history of this piece is quite surprising because, first of all, we don't really know who the dedicatee was. If it was someone called Elise, it's probable that it was a lady called Elise Wagenfeld, but we don't really know. It seems more likely, since the sketches were in her possession until the 1860s, that it was dedicated to Teresa Malfatti, who was a woman that Beethoven was in love with around the time when it was composed in 1810. So it's also possible the piece shouldn't be called Fur Elise at all. It may be that the dedication, in fact, was Fur Therese. We don't know because the manuscript doesn't exist and hasn't existed since the 1860s when it seems to have been transcribed from sketches in Teresa Malfatti's collection, which she then gave to a guy called Ludwig Noll, and he transcribed it and had it published in the 1860s, long after Beethoven's death, you know, 40 years after Beethoven's death. And thereafter, the piece has become famous. And the reason why it's become famous is partly, of course, because it's an extremely memorable tune. And its very memorability and simplicity may have been the reason why Beethoven himself doesn't seem to have liked it much. <laughs> uh, but the other reason why it's been a huge hit, I think, is because it's one of the few pieces in Beethoven's output that's kind of playable uh, for people who aren't professional musicians. So it's it's one of these pieces that is... And fun to learn, you know, when you are learning the piano, Firlis is a, a rather beautiful, relatively straightforward piano piece that you can learn. So these are some of the mysterious factors in the history of the work. In the form that we know it, it may not entirely be a piece by Beethoven. It may be a sort of adaptation of a sketch that Beethoven made in 1810 by a later dude called Ludwig Noll. And that published version is the one that, that people know today. And the fascinating thing is that in 1822, Beethoven made a second version for publication because he was publishing a set of bagatelles that year. And he created several new pieces, but he also kind of rehashed some older pieces. This was one of them. And he made a new version where he changed things, shuffled things around, altered the sequence of notes, did all sorts of fascinating things. And then, at the point where things were moving towards publication, he rejected it again because <laughs> he didn't think it was good enough to include in this set of bagatelles, so it didn't get published. But the fascinating thing is that that later sketch from 1822 does exist, and so the actual notes that we know Beethoven wrote down for a potential publication, we've got it. It's completely unknown. Uh, very few people know that it exists. I mean, in scholarly circles, it's known that it exists, but, but it isn't often played. So let's discuss the piece and discuss the later version. And then at the end of the video, if you want to forward wind to the end of the video, you can and you, you can hear the, the full later version of the piece. So let's talk a little bit about the famous version that everyone knows. This is a, a sort of slow, song-like piece. Another reason why it's very popular is the texture of the music is very simple. It doesn't have the complex motivic fabric that you often get with Beethoven's music. It doesn't have all that much counterpoint either. The left hand consists mainly of sort of harp-like accompaniment figures. The right hand is very melodic and song-like, a sort of song without words, before Mendelssohn, who of course was heavily influenced by Beethoven, before Mendelssohn invented the term song without words in the 1830s. Or was it Fanny Mendelssohn? Actually, his sister possibly came up with the idea before Felix did. Anyway, one of the Mendelssohn siblings came up with that 
term, the song without words, didn't really exist in Beethoven's time. He would have called it, and, and was going to call it, a bagatelle, a trifle, when he was thinking about publishing it in the 1820s. So it starts off famously. I mean, is there anything more famous except perhaps the theme tune of Jaws? <laughs> Has the same motivic content, the oscillating semitone figure. And in Beethoven, that oscillating semitone functions as what we call an anacrusis, as a rhythmic preparation for the tune, the real tune, is, is this little falling figure, and then you get a kind of rising, three rising notes, almost like the reverse of three blind mice. Da, da, da. And then the anacrusis comes before each of these very simple cadential patterns. Now, the oscillating anacrusis is much harder to explain than to play. This famous thing. There is a theory, and I think it's a perfectly plausible one, that the name of the dedicatee, probably Teresa Malfatti, but let's imagine it was for Elise. It doesn't really matter. Elise and Therese, the musical letters in both names consist of E, S, I'll explain that in a minute, and E. <laughs> so we've got E... S in German is E flat and E again. So the, the alternation of the two notes in the published manuscript is E and D sharp because D sharp on the keyboard is the same note as E flat. You have in effect a sort of musical version of the obsession around the lady in question. But that may explain the slightly obsessive repetitive element in the piece that is so characteristic of it. And also the element that I think Beethoven may have been somewhat irritated by <laughs> and explains why he never really was that interested in publishing it. So here we go. So we've got the oscillating pattern. And then these harp-like figures. The rising three-note motif. And the second time coming back to A and the open fifth. Uh, and then we go into little middle bit where we have an equally simple falling four note tetrachord, but in C. The basic line is just, just four descending notes, but with these beautiful little da 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 da. Da, 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 da. The, the, the obsessive rhythm of the piece, I should say, Beethoven's a highly rhythmic composer, and the obsessive rhythm of the piece, well, there are two elements. One is the, the long anacrusis of semitones, but the main motif is that da 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 dum, da 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 dum, ba, da, that thing. Now, I'll prove that to you because later on in the piece, he takes that rhythmic figure, da 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 dum, da 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 dum. Incidentally, it's the same as same as the Fifth Symphony. It's a motif that Beethoven's very keen on. And here it is again in a very different way. Look at this in the middle. So that, there it is again. So it appears in the music in various guises, but that rhythmic formation, that da 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 da, is a sort of obsessive component in the music. And it links the piece in quite an interesting way to another composition of Beethoven's from a few years earlier the great Tempest Sonata, which he wrote around 1803. And the finale of the Tempest Sonata is very similar texturally and rhythmically. It's this. fabulous piece much more to be honest interesting than for Elise we'll talk about that some other time but that rhythm very similar to it's, it's a similar design isn't it and also the harp like accompaniment interestingly in the Tempest Sonata Often pianists play it too fast and with too much pedal and it destroys the unique rhythmic structure of this music. The left hand, Beethoven notates it very carefully. 
with the emphasis on the second semiquaver. One and two and three and one and two. So you get this wonderful second semiquaver emphasis. Remember that because when we're looking at the second version of Furlis, we'll discover the same device, a rhythmic displacement onto the second semiquaver. Let me just finish by explaining very, very quickly how Beethoven structures the version of Furlis that's familiar to everybody. We have the main theme, and at the end of the tune, uh, we then go into a. So this is a passage where Beethoven very explicitly, I think, goes into the style of a kind of aria with a soprano melody in the right hand, rather operatic, left hand with this rolling semiquaver accompaniment. That leads to a return of the tune. Then a second episode, a darker episode in A minor. remember playing this as a kid and this was my favorite passage in some ways it still is it's Beethoven at his most brooding and it has this magnificent shift I'll show you the shift in a minute here comes a repetition Beethoven loves this kind of thing where you remove the bass note that moves from D minor Second inversion, he just shifts it on a semitone. Incidentally, semitones are a topic of the piece. He shifts up a semitone from A to B flat, and suddenly, for a moment, a window opens on a different tonality where we're in B flat major, and then he turns back to A minor. In this original version, we then go into a little triplet cadenza with a chromatic descent and then, and then he returns to the tune. In terms of the form of the whole piece, it's a very elegant rondo structure, what we, what we call a rondo. In other words, the theme returns three times and each time it appears, it's separated from its previous appearance by what we call an episode. Another thing comes in, interrupts the tune or takes over from the tune. And then that leads back to a reappearance of the tune. So we have a very simple rondo form, A, B, A, C, A. So that's the original structure of Furlis, a very elegant, very short piano composition that Beethoven probably sketched out almost without thinking about it one fine day in 1810 as a sort of potential love gift to Teresa Malfatti. And as with all the women who Beethoven proposed to or declared his interest towards, <laughs> she did not reciprocate. One of the women that Beethoven approached, incidentally, was asked many, many years later why she didn't accept his proposal of marriage. After all, he was one of the most famous people in European culture. Why would he reject Ludwig van Beethoven, the great genius? And she responded, because he was ugly and half mad. Aww. So I think that tells you all you need to know about why Beethoven was, very sadly, unhappy in love. So now, the really interesting part of this video, hopefully, is that I'm going to turn my attention to the later version, the 1822 version, that Beethoven prepared for publication. This is the version that we actually have a manuscript copy of Beethoven's notoriously sketchy and weird handwriting so it's very hard to make out the notes unless you're an expert but we do have this second version and it's strikingly different from the first so when he came back to the piece in the 1820s he he did several things the most immediately noticeable thing is that he alters the accompaniment do you remember when i was playing <laughs> The beautiful finale of the Tempest Sonata and I stress that the second that the left hand has this emphasis on the second semiquaver so in the later version of Furlis Beethoven <laughs> all right there Loki uh, in this second version of Furlis Beethoven alters the accompaniment so that every time it comes in on the second semiquaver. Uh, isn't that amazing? So it's, it's never quite predictable. It's slightly 
offsets the simplicity of the tune with this strange dislocation in the accompaniment. I'll show you how that works. So isn't that fascinating? You also had that on the repeat, he avoided the da ga da ga da so he's slightly breaking up the melodic elements to, to get rid of the over-repetitive nature of the original material. And perhaps most interestingly, with the offbeat left hand, it's almost as if he's displaced the first beat of each bar. Da, da, da. So everything's sort of floating just off the beat. It's a really interesting effect. Uh, and he continues it into the second half of the tune. Do you notice there an almost Chopin-esque, beautiful, tumbling, ornamented figure? Because he's bored with going... So he breaks it up into triplets. It's a much more fluent, sort of uh, supple uh, melodic line. And then uh, the second time, even even more interestingly, duplets, triplets, semiquavers. So you get a little sort of written out accelerando. All of that's slightly different, isn't it? And then the first episode comes in straight away, but it's it's introduced by a little bit of music that none of us have ever heard before, which is this. So end of tune. So that much more elegant little transition into the first episode, isn't that better? I think that's better than the original. Uh, the original version just went... <laughs> straight, straight, in. slightly clumsy edit, I'd say. So later version, much more elegantly, Beethoven writes out this very expressive transition. a much more elaborate melody. We go into the demi semi quaver passage, that's very similar to how it was originally. Back into the melody, uh, once again with the rhythmic displacements. And then the, uh, the beautiful A minor episode, the second episode of the piece, is similar to the original version, but I'll show you how it works. doesn't go into the, do you remember in the original version he went into the semi quaver thing? That comes later, he's shifted that the position of the cadenza, so we come out of the second episode straight into the tune again. Repetition of the melody, and we hear the melody again, and then right at the end, uh, we get the, the cadenza is now tapped on here, right at the end of the piece. And that leads, I think, more effectively, really, into the concluding three-bar coda. Um, so it's altogether a more professional piece, in a sense. It's more elegantly realised. I think the details that Beethoven felt in the original version were a bit clumsy, have been rendered more supple, more interesting. The rhythmic elements are more surprising. And the whole piece is rather beautiful, I have to admit. I think the second version is better but I'd be interested in what you guys think. In the meantime, here 
in our traditional manner is an animated realization with me playing it of the unknown but in some ways more authentic second version of Furlis as Beethoven intended it to be published in 1822. Enjoy. <laughs> 